Hare Krishna. Welcome back to our demystifying reincarnation series. We are discussing about how reincarnation has been present in world thought across all the inhabited continents and it has also been present in all the great religions of the world. We discussed in the previous session about how Christianity, although the Bible doesn't talk about it, the Bible does not just it does not explicitly deny or reject it either and it was definitely a discussable concept at that time and further in the in the bible itself as far as the coming of the the coming again of the prophet elijah that is his reincarnation that is talked about at least seven times so the idea that people can come back that is definitely there in the bible now there have been many eminent uh, Christian thinkers who have all accepted reincarnation. For example, there was the Clement of Alexandria from 150 to 220 AD, Justin Martyr 100 to 165, Saint Gregory of Nyssa uh, 250 to 332, Arnobius around 290, and Saint Jerome 340 to 420. Even Saint Augustine, who is who is considered one of the Found, is considered the founder of Christian theology. He writes in his book Confessions, Did my infancy succeed another age of mine that dies before it? Was it that which I spent within my mother's womb? And what before that life again, O God of my joy? Was I anywhere or in anybody? So, he clearly does not reject this idea, but he considers it and considers it in a mood of prayerful contemplation and devotion. And perhaps the most uh, direct propagator of Christian of reincarnation with among the church thinkers was Origen. Now, Origen was consi is considered by the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica as the most prominent and prolific of all the church fathers with the, poss with the possible exception of St. Augustine. And he is glorified by Christians of great stature like St. Jerome who proclaimed him the greatest teacher of the church after the apostles and St. Gregory, Gregory Bishop of Nyssa who honored Origen as the prince of Christian learning in the 3rd century. So, Origen accepted reincarnation but thereafter, through a whole complex web of theopolitics, religion and politics being brought together, that led to the uh, condemnation of origin and his teachings, including the teaching of reincarnation. Now, how that happened is described in a blow-by-blow -blow account by uh, Jedis MacGregor in his book, Reincarnation and Christianity. MacGregor is a Christian theologian and Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southern Uni California. So, so Origen lived in about 180, AD 185 to 254 and because he accepted and talked about reincarnation, so that became widely propagated. It was considered mainstream Christian belief. But three centuries later after that, there was the Emperor Justinian, the Roman Emperor. 483 to 565 and he felt he wanted Christianity uh, to be redefined and to be reused as a tool for reinforcing his own political power and his hold on the subjects. So, he felt that if people were taught that uh, you have many lives that if you do not become moral, if you do not become obedient to God and by extension by obedient to God means also obedient to a king who is considered to be the sacred monarch the rep uh, who is representing God. Then uh, if they have the idea that they are going to become, they have only one life, then they will be more diligent in becoming devoted to God. So, he felt that we should tell them, give them one life or give them hell. And with this idea, he 
manipulated the Christian church establishment to have originism, the originism which had within it the idea that the soul reincarnates over many lifetimes, he decided to have it condemned. And he convened in Constantinople in, four, in 543 AD a synod that passed a papal edict rejecting originism in general and reincarnation in particular. Now at that time, the reigning pope was Pope Vigilius and he was not even present at that time. Uh, and he opposed the imperial edict. This was passed by the cons by Justinian and Vigilius opposed it and he broke off all communication with the emperor. But eventually, he when he arrived in Constantinople, he was pressurized by the king and he reversed his earlier rejection. And he to avoid the idea that the king has any king is having any say in theological matters, he himself issued an independent statement of his own condemning the same thing which Justinian had condemned. Now the papal edict which came out, there was an imperial edict which came from the king, there was a papal edict which came out from the pope. The papal edict was widely condemned by bishops all across Europe and Africa, hmm. especially from in Gaul, West Africa, the bishops severely castigated it and then after several years of contemplation in 550, Pope Vigilius withdrew the edict. But then Justinian still was insistent on his idea, so in 553 he convened another um, Another synod, he in fact called the whole church in the Second Council of Constantinople, also known as the Fifth Ecumenical Council of the Church. And he arranged this whole uh, council in such a way that the, all, the, all the fathers who were supporting origin were absent over there. And with the decks, decks just thoroughly stacked against originism, he had originism declared as an anathema. He handed out as a papal edict, if anyone asserts the fabulous pre-existence of souls and the monstrous restoration which follows them, follows from it, let him be anathema, let him be cursed. So this convention had happened, this council had happened in May and the Pope was not present over there and the Pope tried to uh, resist it by hiding. So from May till December, almost seven months, he stayed in hiding. But finally, on uh, in fe February of 554, on 23rd February, he surrendered and he ratified the council statements and in that way, originism was declared as exiled. And even at that time, the churches in the West rebelled with some dioceses, closing communications with Rome for a long time. And in West Africa, there was such a strong opposition to it that the Roman Emperor had to send troops into West Africa to have the edict imposed by the imperial troops. So because of this whole uh, complicated conspiracy and controversy that surrounded originism, there are many Catholic theologians who argue that actually the whole uh, ecumenical council in which originism was condemned, that itself is not officially true and that Catholic, that actually originism is never condemned in Catholicism and that Catholics can still accept originism including especially reincarnation and such, such reservations about the Fifth Ecumenical Council's uh, of reports or actions are, are, are stated in, in reference books as respected as the Catholic Encyclopedia itself. So, there are many Christian scholars who talk about reincarnation as being not only acceptable within Christianity but even as respectable. For example, the Swiss, the globally renowned Swiss Catholic thinker Hans Kung, in his book, Eternal Life, Life After Death as a Medical, Philosophical and Theological Problem, advocates that Christianity should not only accept reincarnation but also elevate it to a central issue. 
Similarly, there are many other Catholic uh, right, Christian writers in the Christian tradition who talk about this. There is John Herney, Professor of Theology at Fordham University, William L. D. Artega, a Christian minister, John H. Hick, Danforth Professor of Philosophy and Religion, Quincy Howe Jr., an Associate Professor of Classics at Scripps College and a, gra a graduate at Harvard, Columbia and Princeton. So, reincarnation is definitely uh, acceptable and as what was at one time respectable within Christianity. Now, if you move on from Christianity, so there is Judaism, Christianity and Islam. All these three are Abrahamic religions. And if you look at Islam, again in, in the, the sacred book of Islam, that is Quran, it, it does not talk explicitly about reincarnation. So that is typical of the sacred books of the Abrahamic religions. And yet, at the same time, there are several verses which talk about living again. For example, in the Quran, 22.66 it is stated, He is the one who gave you life, Ayakum, and he will cause you to die, Yumitukum, and he will give you life again, Yuhikum. So now, again it is told, and a few verses later, it is God who created you, then provided for you, then he will cause you to die, then he will give you life again. Now, there are some Islamic thinkers who say that this, these verses refer to resurrection, not reincarnation. Resurrection means at the time of, at the time of judgment, those who have been faithful, they will, they are, they are all going to die now, but at the time of death, they will be resurrected and then they will live forever after that. But this verse, whereas, so resurrection refers to dying and then re being reborn again, whereas re reincarnation refers to going through many births and deaths. So while, while this, while some thinkers, Islamic thinkers say that this refers to resurrection, but actually the verses themselves are not specific like that. They can very well refer to reincarnation also. Now, for example, the Islamic scholar G. F. Moore states in his Ingersoll lectures on transmigration that, among Mohammedans, the difficulty of reconciling the sufferings of innocent children with the goodness or even the justice of God led some of the liberal theologians to seek a solution in sins committed in the former existence. Reincarnation is fundamental to the doctrine of Imam as held by the Shiites. It was developed in a characteristic form by the Ismailis and is the cardinal doctrine of Babism. So similarly, now uh, Islamic historian E.G. Brown talks about the literary history of Persia and he says that uh, the classical Muslim thinkers in the esoteric schools, they accepted three kinds of uh, reincarnations or three, three kinds of transmigrations we could say. There was Hutul, which is the periodic incarnation of a saint or prophet. Then there was Reef, the immediate return of an Imam or any other important spiritual leader after death. And there is Tansuk, the ordinary incarnation of all souls. Beyond this, uh, there is an influential sect within Islam, that is the Sufis. The Sufis have had tremendous influence uh, uh, through their mystical and devotional effusiveness. And while some people consider, the Su some Muslims consider Sufis to be heretics, but actually uh, this tradition has existed for more than a thousand years and it has many followers, steady followers in Lebanon, Jordan and Syria. And among them, say, the, the Persian Muslim theologian Sufi mystic Jalaluddin Rumi says, I died as a mineral and became a plant. I died as a plant and rose to animal. I died as animal and I was man. Why should I fear? When was I less by dying? When was I less by dying? So the Sufis consider reincarnation to be a central doctrine. And similarly, there is Nadar Beg Mirza who has written a book called Reincarnation in Islam. And there he gives extensive reasoning to explain how belief in reincarnation is harmonizable with, with the Quran in specific and Islamic tradition in general. So now after discussing the Abrahamic religions, let's move on to Buddhism. Now in Buddhism, reincarnation is a central tenet right from the beginning. This is seen directly in the stories about Buddha himself, which are called the famously known as the Jataka tales. These describe there are 547 stories of Buddha's past incarnations. And the whole theme of these stories is that 
uh, how Buddha acted compassionately in his many previous lives. And then that compassion, those towards whom he was compassionate, they reciprocate in this life and they become his followers. So, for example, in a previous life, it is said Buddha was a elephant. And at that time, when there was a woman in distress, so he went to great extreme as an elephant to protect her and he even filed off his own trunks so that she could be protected. And remembering this, that woman in a future life, when she is born, reborn at a time when Buddha is there, she becomes a disciple of Buddha and becomes dedicated to her. She sees his selfless sacrificing spirit and then she sacrifices her life for Buddha. And if we move down from Buddha's own past lives to current times, for example, in Tibet there is the influential leader the Dalai Lama. Now it is said that the Dalai Lama, as soon as he dies, actually he is the spiritual head of Tibetan Buddhism, as soon as he dies, he is reborn again. And there is a whole elaborate process by which the by which who the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama is, who the Dalai Lama has reincarnated, that is discerned. There are general as well as specific signs by which the Lamas, the sacred, uh, sacred people within, sacred leaders in Buddhism, they search out and find out who is the, reinc who is the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. And then that person is selected, trained, and that once the person is identified, and the person is uh, actually taken into training, and then eventually, is accepted as the Dalai Lama, next Dalai Lama. So, right from the fine beginnings of Buddhism till the current times, the idea of reincarnation has always been central to Buddhism. Now, Buddhism has also evolved over the centuries, and there have become, there have, uh, there are more, <coughs> there are practices like Zen Buddhism which focus more on complex meditational techniques rather than on metaphysical questions. But even in these techniques, the focus has been, on, even in such fields of such branches of Buddhism, there has been an acceptance of reincarnation. So, for example, Zen master Chao Chao, he says that before the existence of the world, the self-nature is after the destruction of the world, the self-nature remains intact. The self-nature, of course, refers to the spiritual being, the spiritual essence, the non-destructible part of us. Now, interestingly, while reincarnation has been accepted in Buddhism, there are some people who say that Buddhism does not accept the existence of the soul. So, these are, uh, there are the, these are, we see the two extremes in Christianity, in the Abrahamic religions, there is the acceptance of soul, but in the mainstream versions of these religions, there is acceptance of the soul, but there is no acceptance of reincarnation. Whereas in Buddhism, there is acceptance of reincarnation, but there is no acceptance of the soul. Now, if there is reincarnation, there has to be something that goes from one body to another. There is something that reincarnates. There is some one in fact that reincarnates. So, when Buddha is said to reincarnate, obviously there is someone who is reincarnating from one body to another. So, if that is not the soul, then what is it? So, the idea of reincarnation without the soul is, has led to endless philosophical problems for Buddhist thinkers right from the beginning of Buddhism down to modern times. So, now this idea of anattavad. There are many Buddhist thinkers who say, uh, there's, uh, who say that actually this did not originate in the teachings of Buddha. It was later adopted by some Buddhisms who wanted to, Buddhists who wanted to establish their theological autonomy from Hinduism. That means, Buddhism was an offshoot of Hinduism and at that time when the Buddhists want to different, differentiate their doctrine from the doctrine of Hindus, so they came up with uh, this idea. How do we differentiate? Hindus accept the soul, then we want, to dif we want to differentiate ourselves from it. So, they said that we will not accept the soul. So, now for example, there is a German bhikkhu, um, George Grimm, in his book The Doctrine of Buddha, uh, reports 
the Buddha's reaction to the no soul doctrine, Anattavad. He says, and I, O monks, am accused wrongly, vainly, falsely, and inappropriately by some ascetics and Brahmanas. A denier is the ascetic Gotama. He teaches the destruction, annihilation, and the perishing of the being that now exists. These ascetics accuse me of being what I am not, O monks, and of saying what I do not say. Of saying what I do not say. In general, Buddha's approach was more pragmatic than philosophical. Whenever he was asked with complex philosophical questions uh, or uh, questions about philosophical subjects, he focused more on practical things. So, for example, when he was asked, Who are you? Are you a god? He said, No. Are you an angel? He says, Are you the supreme? He says, no. Then who are you? He says, I am awake. So, I am awake. So, basically, rather than getting into philosophical technicalities about identification of who he was, he focused primarily on the uh, principle of becoming awake, becoming spiritually aware, become rising to a higher level of consciousness. So, Buddha's teachings in that sense were more of ethical. There are the, there is the right thinking, the right, uh, right living. So, there are the teachings of Buddha, if we see, they focus more on practical uh, practicalities. And further, when Buddha was asked, so is the soul different from the body? He remained silent. When he was asked, is the soul the same as the body? He remained silent. And exasperated, the questioner walked away. And the questioner walked away, then Buddha's followers turned towards him and says, why did you remain silent? And he said that this person was coming with a particular worldview, had a certain conception that whatever answer I would have given, it would have simply reinforced the misconception. So, I just remained silent. So, essentially, Buddha did not talk much about metaphysics. But overall, the very idea of reincarnation and the subsequent understanding of the centrality of reincarnation points to the idea that there has to be a soul who reincarnates. So, overall, the reincarnation is definitely a central tenet of Buddhism. So, in this way, we look at today's talk, we, uh, we look at multiple at the world's various religions, discuss about in Christianity the concept of reincarnation of a pre-existence of the soul is definitely discussable and it was mainstream in, in Christian theology with uh, origin propagating it but we discussed the whole web of theopolitics by which uh, Justinian had declared anathema and Vigilius the Pope at that time uh, reluctantly uh, succumbed to that pressure and when many bishops opposed it they had to be suppressed by uh, the imperial troops. Then we discussed about, uh, so, so that is why many uh, Catholic thinkers now say that originism was never declared anathema or that declaration is not valid and there are some Catholic thinkers who say that reincarnation should not, be ex not only be accepted but made as a central teaching in Christianity. Now moving on to Islam, we saw how in Islam although there is no direct reference to reincarnation, there is definitely the reference to living again and there are there are the esoteric uh, streams within Islam such as Sufism which definitely accept reincarnation uh, as a central belief and there are thinkers within Islam also who talk about reincarnation as compatible with uh, with Quran and the Islamic tradition in general. Then with respect to Buddhism we discuss how reincarnation of Buddha is a central theme in Jataka tales which talk about Buddha's previous lives and the idea that if there is reincarnation, there has to be something that reincarnates and therefore, although some Buddhists talk about uh, the soul not being there, the no soul doctrine, but there are other Buddhists also who consider that this is a later, uh, later insertion, interpolation, uh, but it is not coming from Buddha. So, reincarnation either way is, has been central to Buddhism and thus, if you look at the world's various religious traditions, they do talk about reincarnation and reincarnation is at least compatible if not central to their teachings. In our future sessions, we will discuss about how if we understand reincarnation, then how can, where can we, un we accept reincarnation, then where can we get a, a systematic understanding of it? Which tradition, which source can we turn to? That source we will explore in our next session. Thank you. Hare Krishna.